Hello everybody, from Frets and Fingers, I'm Alex Pickhart and you're watching The Jam Sesh. Today we are honored to be joined by none other than the fingerstyle guitarist Alex Misko. With his mesmerizing, mesmerizing fingerstyle technique and his innovative arrangements, Alex has amassed a massive following worldwide, solidifying his place as one of the most captivating performers and content creators in the scene today. From his spellbinding renditions of classic tunes to his original compositions that push the boundaries of what is possible on guitar, Alex's dedication to his craft shines through in every note he plays. Without further ado, let's welcome Acoustic Guitarist of the Year Award winner, Alex Misko. Welcome to The Jam Sesh. Ooh, yeah, thanks so much, Alex. <laughs> uh, nice, nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure to be on your show, podcast, interview. Excited about it. Perfect. That's awesome, man. Thanks so much. And I guess for the people who don't know who you are, I'm assuming most people who watch my content already know who you are. So, But if you just want to introduce yourself a little bit, give a little background on yourself. Well, you basically just read some nice chat GPT generated thing uh, <laughs> from my website. And well, yeah, I've just uh, been a musician, primarily a fingerstyle guitar player, acoustic guitar player, uh, doing some weird stuff on acoustic guitar, playing modern music uh, for people who like maybe uh, not following the new modern era of people who do things like that. Maybe I, I could refer to people like Andy McKee or Keke King, but like on steroids. Uh, something like that and uh, yeah basically touring around the world playing concerts doing a lot of content for internet uh, well everything that that's modern musicians should do to uh, well uh, to be successful I guess and also on top of that teaching video courses uh, everything and uh, yeah but I prefer to call myself just a touring musician touring musician eh um, so I guess you prefer so out of all the stuff you do, you you prefer the touring over the content creation and all that stuff, eh? That was that, that has always been a goal, and at some point I was even thinking that okay, at some point there should be some video or some song that just blows up, and afterwards you don't need to produce any content anymore because well you're done. I mean your career is set, is settled, and it's set, and now you're just gonna be touring and performing. But uh, then I realized that it's kind of a never-ending process, and it's it's good to put your efforts all the time in social media, and then because of, at least in my in my case, uh, social media managed to help me to become a touring musician because that's where people manage to found, find me, manage that's how I managed to get my first bookings and afterwards it's a totally separate thing how you start basically slowly but surely working on your connections in each country uh, around the world seeing where there's a demand for this type of niche guitar music and because because I mean we also got to say that it's instrumental guitar music modern instrumental guitar music it's not classical at all it goes into more of a singer songwriting directions where just one guy stays on this like, stands on stage talks a lot sometimes more than plays because there's a lot of things to talk about there's a lot of stories there's a lot of explanation of how this thing's working because it's just there are so many new things that even experienced guitar players probably never seen before and this is something very exciting because this is just a totally different question but uh, i'm excited that this genre this niche that we're doing this finger style guitar uh, everything is allowed here it means that nobody would be telling you how to play and what to do as soon as it sounds good as soon as there are people who would want to listen to that then it's amazing Insulted. Right, 100 percent. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I was actually I talked to uh, Mike Dawes last week, and he told me to tell you hi. Um, so yeah, he was. Uh, I have some questions about that after, but uh, he was also mentioning that that you know like his primary like fo like I guess his enjoyment is the live music because you get to connect with your audience in a different way than through social media, right? You have like a a larger audience, let's say online, than you do in the rooms you're playing with, but. Um, there's something special about kind of just connecting with those individuals that have paid to come see you play in real life, you know? I mean, my, Mike is actually my, my huge, huge inspiration. I've been like following his music since I was like little kid just playing guitar in my bedroom and we, well, we, we have become friends throughout the years and uh, well we don't see each other often because we're both either on the road or on different sides of the planet but we had some tours together like in, in China and something like that that was really fun he's, he's a great guy and a great inspiration and it, yeah basically what, what he said is true it's just social media even though it feels like oh you have all these clicks all these followers all these numbers actually doesn't most of the time it doesn't really mean that much because I mean how many of these millions of people actually watch your content like 
20%. And uh, it means that, well, you got to really take care of this 20% of people who follow you regularly, who really care about you, not just some people who followed you back then and then forgot about it. Maybe half of this account's already dead. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe I mean, they already created new ones and this is just something from, from the past that doesn't, well, exist anymore, let's say. So, uh, of course, you feel that connection much, much better, not on social media, even though I appreciate all the comments and all the people who I stay in touch with because there are some, I mean, it's crazy to think there are some people who I got to know through social media and we stay in friends and they keep writing me messages for like for almost a decade already. But at the same time, you when you go and play on stage and then afterwards people come to you, you sign their guitars or like you sell your CDs and they, I don't know, sometimes they even want to play your songs to you or like jam with you playing your song. And that's when you really feel like you make a small difference. Like, I mean, no matter how pretentious it sounds, right? But but I guess it's, it's your way or my way, let's say, to change the world a little bit, right? Just a little bit, but it really makes a change if I inspire somebody to pick up an instrument and to get creative with it. And I guess that's already well, more than enough for me. Right, and I think it's pretty cool that you you mentioned like you, you your biggest or your you had a large inspiration from Mike Dawes before, and you were playing. I went back and I saw you play. You covered quite a few of his songs back yeah, in the day. Yeah, and another guy as well. Uh, it's not only Mike Dawes. It's like it's the whole Candy Red Records uh, catalog. Right, and it's it's interesting now that you you're kind of at your own wave now of uh, musicians uh, that you're inspiring. So how does that feel, kind of to be kind of not leading the charge, but also kind of building out your own niche? Because I would say you and Mike. Yes, you're both finger style guitarists, but you have your own kind of flair to your own style of playing, right? So, um, yeah, how does that feel? Well, it feels like a natural progression because, as I said, in the beginning, I was just really happy to... Uh, I, I think I just was so lucky to find this whole finger style niche in general. I, I, was, I called it genre once already, but it's not a genre, right? It's just an array of techniques which people use to... Modern techniques, which people use to create modern music or to write modern music or to arrange modern music so that's why it has really like vague connection to classical guitar or loose connections almost non-existent it's like a totally different thing it's more like singer songwriting stuff and um that's why it's just at first i was just so happy that okay i found the music that i like uh, and I started learning this music like crazy. Not only Mike Dawes' stuff, but John Gom, Don Ross, Preston Reed, Andy McKee. There's like a lot of guys that I appreciate. There's like real legends in this niche. And uh, and then at some point, well, I guess it, there was the natural transition. Like, okay, I mean, they do arrangements. I can try to do arrangements. Okay, they write music. Then I can write music. But it's not because like I have like such belief in myself. Oh, I'm the greatest composer of all time. But it's just because it's it's natural thing. It's like uh, you when you learn so many songs, you inevitably get an idea of how this whole thing works. Not only technically, but also musically and structure wise and everything. Even though you don't know much theory behind it. Or oh, I didn't know much back then. Like I wasn't really getting any uh, professional education in the field of music but uh, there's a lot of uh, things that you can grasp just by ear and uh, yeah and then I kind of st started to think okay well it seems like I can express myself the best when I write original music and then it took me like I don't know five more five albums afterwards to actually kind of I don't know, to learn how to do, to learn the craft, even though, I mean, it's a never-ending process that would take the whole life, but I'm really dedicated on working exactly on that, aside from doing arrangements and all the other things. And on what, what you were asking is that now it's my kind of own way of doing things. Sometimes, I mean, year after year, I'm going into more this crazy, unique, modified guitar direction that at this point, really nobody has. And it's not like, you know, I'm trying to brag about it. Oh, you know, like I'm playing the super unique guitar that nobody in the world has. It's just because nobody needs it. <laughs> it's still not like... <laughs> but but I, find, I, I find joy and pleasure into this. I, it took me years to keep, come up with all these concepts. And at this point, because nobody does it, nobody has ever done it before, I literally have to carve the way through to see, okay, now I have this. And how I can use it. Yes, I can still take the, well, let's say the bricks of inspiration from other people, or like I still will write music based on structures or like, I mean, notes and harmonies, which are, well, I'm not writing weird ambient, uh, I don't know, noise music, right? It's it still, well, should be guitar compositions, but utilizing all these new techniques and all these new sounds that I can get from my guitar or from my pedals or everything combined, that at this point, nobody has done before and it feels exciting because well it feels like you're carving the way you just show people what what can be done and you're also excited about it because well you never done it before nobody has ever done it before and then afterwards of course there will come people after me hopefully soon that would be able to use it better <laughs> it's always like that yeah that that makes a lot of sense i actually kind of want to touch on a couple of those um 
like modifications you have on the guitar. So I did a little, I think I'd either I'd read about it or I listened, I listened to so many interviews you were on or like talks, like things where you were talking just to get like some information. But uh, you have like banjo tuner pegs, which I think is pretty cool. And I, I played banjo for a couple of years, but I'm assuming that's just so you can, you can get that. Um, you can tune up and down really quick, right? Like it, it yeah, that, that, that's the whole idea. I mean, it's like I have my guitar here with me just, just okay. in case, just to show. So uh, this is how my headstock looks like, and it's it's super weird. Uh, it's my Frankenstein guitar. We can Frankenstein. We can yeah, we can talk about it well, uh, a bit later. But just to quickly uh, touch the question. So this this are the banjo tuners, and they look like this. They kind of face towards this direction instead of the guitar tuning peg direction like this. So it like serves many purposes that were that not possible to do with normal guitar tuning pegs. So for example. With normal guitar tuning pegs, you tune like that, which is really hard to do on the fly, right? Because you have to like put all your hands all the way here or here, which is super uncomfortable. But for banjo tuning pegs, everything is really grabbable. <laughs> it's really comfortable right. to do. And on top of that, yeah, you have the two screws here that set the note within two note interval. So at first, of course, I need to find the first note. I, it's not fully automated. I need to find it. Then I need to screw it. Then I need to go back to the lower note. I need to screw it again. And eventually I have... Okay. It's a bit out of tune now, but anyways. So uh, yeah, and then of course the system is not perfect. You need to fine tune it here and there, and uh, but it oh, oh, it's already opens up so many possibilities, like tuning all these harmonics and things. Uh, do you want to try maybe some of the lower strings? I feel like your uh, camera might not be picking up the the higher strings. Anyways, sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, you mean the what, what do you mean the the audio? Yeah, the audio is not picking up. I think the higher, the higher frequency. Ah, probably. Ah, probably. There's a noise gate. Um, yeah, of course, of course. So, for example, let me just set it. So, so yeah, that's. Well, it, I mean, it's not that musically exciting <laughs> because it's just a, it's just a super low. Yeah, so I think that you're, you're, I think the camera, you said there's a, uh, a sound gate. I think it's not picking up those sound gates. Okay. Don't anyways, it's, it's, it. it's on my um, phone, anyways. It's on my phone. So I actually, it might be better there yeah. because that would be again. Oh, okay. No, perfect. No, no yes, cool. Go ahead, continue. But can you just we'll imagine that it goes. I'm just going to be, well, imitating that with my, <laughs> with my voice then. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, that's the whole thing. It's just literally that's, that's everything what you do. But again, then you've got to be creative with that. It's just tuning pegs. And, uh, well, then it requires to write music about it. Around it, around using these techniques. For example, using using this bendy harmonics or anything else you can come up with, and uh, tapping any anything you can come up with. There's a lot of context. And I first saw John Gom doing that, and then I uh, found out that um, there was other gu other guitar guys who started doing that way before John, like Nick Harper and Adrian Legg, also the great UK guitar player from the UK. And before that, it was all this plethora of banjo players like uh, Earl Scruggs and Bill Keith and uh, the, the guys who actually invented these pegs in like late 60s. So it's, it's really big, great and long history behind this system. But in the guitar world, it's not so common. It's not so well known yet. That's why it's always well. It always strikes the eye and the ear. Everybody thinks you do it by ear. You're doing these crazy things. You have a perfect pitch or whatever. But in fact, it's just it's super easy. But again, you gotta find a way how to do it musically because otherwise it's just gonna be pow 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 pow. And what to do with that? You can just do it yep. with a fret, right? <laughs> so you really gotta find the find the good musical context. But I've been using these techniques for like for so many years. So at some point I was thinking, and this is like kind of going back to why Frankenstein guitar is so unique, that I was thinking, okay, well, we have six tuning pegs here and I can change the tuning of six strings here, like within one step or half step or whatever I can choose. But then, okay, why can I do it here on the bridge side? And then we did the same thing on a bridge. And then, okay, then I found another system that I can put in the headstock so I can change the tuning on the headstock as well. So now I have three notes or four notes per string that I can change, and which is like crazy. Nobody has done it before. And of course, this is well. The guitars were not made for this. It's like it takes a lot of time to fine tune everything and to well prepare the, prepare the guitar for the song that you're going to play. But to me, it's all worth it because it's just the excitement of adventure of this exploration of what the guitar can do but at the same time you still want to make it musical so eventually when somebody listens to that it's not about the technique like oh it's not about constantly thinking oh it's like oh that's that's how he's doing that it's crazy i mean of course when you see see that visually it's it i guess it adds some flair to it but i'm trying to write music around it not not the technique right uh, yeah i showed my uh 
last week I was talking to my brother just saying, oh, I'm, you know, I'm interviewing this guy named Alex Misco and he didn't know who you were. And then I just, sh I showed you a video, uh, showed a video of you doing it where you're like messing around with the tuner peg, uh, the tuning pegs and the, what are they called? I wrote them down, the Tamara string drops. Yeah, Tamara string drops. Yeah, exactly. Just... Those, those things, the levers on the headstock, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was just kind of mind blown with the different like sounds you were getting out of the guitar. Yeah, it's it's crazy, man. And like the fact that you're kind of innovating that. And yeah, where how did those come about? The the Tamara string drops. Like, talk about that a little bit. It's like, uh, yeah, let me just quickly show you. So uh, it's these guys in the headstock. They look like six capos, but they're not. Uh, it's 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 actual levers. So uh, they oh, and the idea is very simple. It's even simpler than banjo pegs because banjo pegs have this two two note interval and the pretty complicated um, how it's called. Um, not the not the sun. I think it's sun um, kind of sun based uh, cogs mechanism inside. So it's pretty complicated. It's, they're pretty expensive. Uh, it's almost like clock uh, and um, uh, like like, like a, not, not like like a watches basically. And uh, but for for Tamara string drops, it's just a lever that that pushes the string here, the headstock. Obviously, well, all the strings. And it's nothing much. But if you add it to, to your banjo tuning peg, now you have three notes, so you go... And you already have three notes, which is super exciting. And of course you can do it with harmonics, with open strings, with bass notes, it doesn't matter. You can already play the whole progression just by tuning the thing. But of course you need to set everything beforehand, not that easy. It looks easy when it's, everything is preset already. But at first, you, of course, you need to find that right note, you need to fine tune it here, then you need to push it around and like play around for a little bit just to see if it stays in tune because I mean the system is not perfect so uh, yeah and, and how I found it oh, I just spent too much time on the internet sometimes you really gotta well just you know look for weird things that nobody needs and it's like because really this is so, such a niche thing is that Originally, it's it's the, just one guy uh, who produces them in America. He's been doing that for many, many years, and most of the time, I saw his clients is our Telecaster players who just use it for drop D. It's it's a drop D mechanism basically. So you just do the quick drop D flip, and you play, and then you press it back, and then you play in standard. But I was thinking, okay, let's put them on the six strings, on all the six strings, and see what we can do with like melodies and stuff. And now, basically, we just use them for my signature guitar as well. And it's like it's it's exciting, you know, to find some builders like that, like creators of these mechanisms, and then to, I don't know, to bring all these ideas into the world that they have never been existing before. Like it, it was more like electric guitar thing, drop D thing, but now it's more like an acoustic guitar thing, but in a melodic way. So we offer them for top two strings. It's not a drop D thing at all. Why we need drop D? We need, we need melodies with them. So it's like, uh, so this is exciting. But yeah, I, I was just Googling things. Oh, I don't know, looking for detuning mechanisms or whatever, and I accidentally found them. And just, well, sometimes sometimes it happens. I mean, you need to explore things. You need to, well, be curious. Right, and then you got the fan frets as well across your the Frankenstein and your signature guitar I saw, right? So uh, actually, yeah, I wanted to say that my, my Frankenstein guitar, I mean, the one that I have, my well, left-handed model, it's uh, now not here, not at my place, because we were shooting some videos in Sweden, and now, I, well, I got back to Germany, so it's still flies back <laughs> so I just have my Frankenstein and um, yeah so fan frets it's like also very striking like everybody loves fan frets everybody asks about them if it's an illusion or not especially on this guitar it's pretty, it's pretty extreme fan frets almost like well I would uh, almost like it's almost like a chant guitar uh, or like um, kind of half baritone because of the fan frets because the scale length is noticeably longer than on the regular guitar but uh, uh, well I believe that it really helps with intonation especially in super low tunings I mean that's why I mean in, in gent world and metal world it's really common to have the seven eight string guitars all fan fretted in this low f tunings and i also pretty much play in the similar tunings i have like a sharp now here on my toe on my lowest string my tunings are super low but for different reasons because i don't want to break strings while i'm doing all these crazy tunings <laughs> so it's like that's why the, the the lower you tune the longer your strings would last especially with this like crazy four note per string tunings and uh, yeah and then i realized that okay it's it it, it, it helps with intonation low tunings, it's uh, easy to play because I mean it's just it's, this is something that people don't mention enough. I think that actually they follow your wrist 
motion really smoothly when you go up the neck. Might not be exactly good here, but how often you play F major bar chord? That's the question. How often you play that in fingerstyle? Like, I guess I, I, I never played this type of shapes. Or, and of course, it's even a classical position, it's pretty easy to play. Unless if you're playing in, in this kind of, you know, <laughs> way when your headstock goes right. down. But this is like, well, probably people who play like that, they wouldn't wouldn't be interested in, well, in fan fretted guitar. Uh, and, um, yeah, so, uh, and the third thing, of course, it looks cool. It's like, I think it's such a cool selling factor, especially because there's no uh, affordable acoustic fan fretted guitars in this price range that we offer for my signature guitar. That was also one of the ideas, because normally if you want a fan fretted acoustic guitar or like anything more crazy like this, then of course you probably would want to go to Luthier and to get yourself a handmade unique instrument, but there is no way to make a business out of it. So uh, the, the whole idea was to make something affordable and something that would be based on this model. But it's like, of course, this is a different topic. I'm, I'm probably I'm touching it too early now. Yeah, no, that's okay. I, I do want to, I'll touch on that right, right away. I just wanted to mention, it's funny. I was so curious. I was watching some of your videos. I'm like, how does, how many strings does this guy go through? But now it makes sense that you, you tune down quite a bit to, to eliminate that kind of factor. Actually, that, that's uh. a good question because it's like normally if like, if for example, I don't have concerts to play and uh, because, because this is also an electric guitar. It's, it's basically, it's an electric guitar. There's so many things on top of it and, and inside and all these pickups and electronics inside. There's like seven, seven signals. It's also super interesting. There's seven channels coming out out of it so it's pretty complicated and basically it's an electric guitar it's, it's the guitar made for playing on stage that's that's how it better 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 word it still sounds more or less good acoustically but it was never a goal to build a good acoustic sounding guitar because there's always a compromise the more you the more weird things the more innovative things you want to put on, uh, on it the less traditional it gets and also in terms of the sound so well you, you got to decide what's more important and uh the thing is that if i don't play any concerts if I just practice at home, I'm just basically be playing the strings until they break. And normally just, well, two or, two or even three weeks sometimes. I mean, I don't play like for six hours every day. I mean, sometimes I just, well, I can just play for half an hour. But in general, it's not the crazy big problem. It's not like, oh, I'm going to be practicing now and in two hours something's going to snap. No, that's the thing. And if I and if I really don't want anything to snap, I'm going to tune like even half step lower or something like that. So my standard tuning now is actually standard, but two steps lower. So starting from C. So C, F, whatever. And if I need my standard tuning, my real standard tuning, if I want to jam with other musicians, for example, or if I want to play a song in the standard, in the real standard tuning, I just put a capo and that's it. It just really eliminates so many problems. And also, of course, it's easier to play because your frets are smaller when you go up the neck. So it's easier to fret them as well. The tension is also e well lighter, so it's easier to fret them. It's like, it feels like a great solution for, for almost everything. That makes a lot of sense. And I know for myself, like I, my guitars, I, or sorry, my acoustic, I always have it in a half step down, like E flat. I don't know why. Like when I go back to like in standard E tuning, I find the strings, I don't like the way they ring out. I find there's something nice about having just a little bit looser. So I've never tried like that low. So I'd have to see, see what it sounds like. Cause I have to do the same thing a lot of times. I have to capo at the first fret, you know, just to get back to where, whoever I'm playing with this. But uh, I do really want to get into your, uh, your signature guitar that you've kind of released. I'm kind of impressed, you know, you're, not that you're a young guy, you're you know, but you are. You know, you're not even thirty yet, and you're a musician who has its own signature guitar. You have all these business the kind of uh, income streams set up for yourself, and it's like it's very impressive to see. And it's clear, um, like it's obviously it's evidence of your hard work and persistence in this kind of um, this area. You know, like in the music industry. So good on you for that. But yeah, like how what goes into building out a custom guitar like that, and like how long does the process take? Well, at first, yeah, thank you for your kind words. I'm, I'm, I'm really trying. It's like that. The problem is my, my mind is really not business oriented. I mean, some, I think Mike Dawes is actually a much better businessman than me because I mean, you, you always, I mean, I'm always more excited into putting weird things that nobody needs and just spending hours around them. And I know that it's not really convertible in a, into anything. And I'm not going to convert it into money. I would, uh, if I would be more effective of a businessman, I would much rather record three video courses or like, you know, do something that I can sell as a passive income, whatever. But it's so hard for me to well force myself to do it and that's really force i'm not really forcing myself but between being creative and doing business I'll, i will always choose being creative that's why I'll, i'm not i'm not i cannot even say that i'm like a good businessman i'm just well i have to because as a solo musician primarily even though i have my manager even though i have booking agents there's still so much work that's based on around your things that's something that you have to do something that probably nobody else would be able to do better than you 
also because you like probably you have some kind of a OCD thing and you you, you want to make everything perfect and uh, that's why I edit all my videos I most of the time record my music by myself and everything so also of course working on emails and stuff like that so it's just there was a lot of work a lot of non-musical work it's like you, you don't really practice that much of a guitar you most of the time you just post videos so like whatever you work on social media that takes so much more time than actual practicing so that's why I'm saying just well you have to you have to take care of that even if you don't if you, if you don't like it because well otherwise nobody would be doing that for you unless if you have the whole team behind my back but i'm not a big superstar to actually well afford it or to, to have some people who would care about it that much so i have to do well things by myself but actually about the signature guitar I'm just really lucky to work with this uh, really nice German German company. They're called Baton Rouge, and uh, it, not not to uh, mix them up with Baton Rouge in Louisiana. Some people ask me if it's connected, but it's it's a different thing. <laughs> so the, the the logo looks like that. It's the I'm just showing to my phone and shown here. So this is just BR. It's a uh, Baton Rouge and. Uh, a uh, great, great German company. I've been playing their guitars since like 2017, I think, and then I switched to another company uh, because, well, I wasn't, uh, uh, well, I, I didn't have enough uh, from the craziness of of the, what Baton Rouge could could offer at that point. And then at some point, we decided to get back together and to have this simple simple idea. So let's see if they can help me make the dream guitar. And uh, then, if everything goes well with that, if I'm happy with that, then we will try to build a signature guitar based on that one. And I will be working with the company. If not, then, well, then I guess I would go somewhere else to find some crazy luthier <laughs> who would be able to build something crazy for me. So, yeah, but actually, but, but I'm really thankful and happy that everything worked out. And uh, our bonds with the company got really close. And uh, we managed to build this Frankenstein guitar. And if you like scroll back i don't know two three four years when i just got this guitar it looked so much more different because this is like it's never ending work in progress at first the whole idea was just to have this bridge and the headstock thing and i also wasn't showing you the bridge so this is the bridge where i can also uh where i can also change change uh, the my, my 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 well the interval that i choose and um yeah, so that was the whole idea. But then afterwards, I realized, okay, I found this drum add-ons and uh, pickup systems and this Tamara things and the headstock. So it's, it keeps evolving, and I don't know where it's gonna come to in a couple of years. Probably it's gonna stop looking the guitar com like like a guitar completely. But uh, the whole idea afterwards was how we can take this guitar that obviously very complicated it's really hard to play it's like this is i mean it's it's a monster that you gotta tame it's not that you just instantly sit and start playing no you gotta spend 20 minutes fine-tuning everything and not everybody's ready for that and on top of that it doesn't sound good acoustically i mean it doesn't sound like something which you would expect acoustically so you really have to keep in mind that this is not just the guitar it's also the pedal board it's also your pickups so this is it's like it's a very complicated system and it's obviously it only i need it to this extent because it's all tailored to my taste and to my vision and uh, people have different visions it's, it's totally fine and i don't want people to play the same exact instruments to do the same exact music i want to do them something different and something better than that. And uh, that's why there was the whole idea that we wanted to take this guitar and to take and, and to keep the most striking things about it, but still to make it affordable and playable and also clean and nice looking and everything. So that's why we really have to keep, we really had to keep the fan frets. That was really one of the big things about it. And um, some of the detuning systems that we offer, just two Benji pegs and just two Timaras, but they are also not necessary. They go as additional options. But if you just take the naked guitar with the same body, com with the same wood combination as this guitar has, so spruce top, uh, uh, what's that? <laughs> it's a um, rosewood and walnut. It's three three wood combination, which is really fancy because I was thinking, well, why why not? Actually, uh, this is really really something interesting about the wood thing uh, that we can also cover. Uh, that I don't think uh, anybody in a real blind experiment would ever would be able to find the difference. In, in terms of if it's the real wood or if it's laminated or whatever, it just it's all like the whole guitar world is like I think it's so oversaturated with this whole idea that we need to have discussions about things that we don't do music but we just discuss things. Let's discuss which top is better. Let's discuss which pickup is better. Let's discuss that I want this guitar but not this guitar. And instead of making music, and this I think this is like something that's getting that something that's getting lost so much especially like i mean i used to get lost in that as well when i was setting up my pedal board because the choice is so big and at some point i think you just spend more time turning the knobs instead of creating music but eventually your audience at, at, on, on like on, on stage will never be able to re 
even find the difference between your Boss RV5 reverb and Strymon Big Sky, even though for you it would be like, oh, wow, it's like such a big difference, like I, I want to play my Strymon. No offense to Boss, I love Boss, but I mean, Strymon is better. And uh, yeah, but, but I mean, but eventually, would your listener care about it if your music is bad or if you just if your technique is not precise or whatever. I mean, it's like such things that people get lost in details. That's why I was just thinking, okay, it's fancy to have three wood combination because back and sides actually, I don't know, they, they create 10% of the whole general sound. So we just were looking for the top spruce top. It's not only traditional fingerstyle thing, uh, like acoustic guitar thing, because it's considered to be bright. But again, if somebody does the blind experiment, even with cedar, which is kind of dark and uh, spruce, which is kind of like bright. And it would be really interesting how many people out of 100 would be able to guess it right. If you would just give, if you just create a blind experiment, you would give these people five random guitars of cedar, five random guitars of spruce and also laminated and not laminated. And how many of them would be able to really find the difference that and would give the result that would be a bit better than just random guessing. I, I think, I, 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 I don't know, I, something tells me that it would be really harder than it seems. Because if I know that spruce is better, I will hear that it's better. I, I it's I, I know that I will hear it because I already persuaded myself to think this way. I'm, it's, it's all in the head already. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm just saying, so that was just the whole idea that, okay, let's just uh, have triple wood combination because it's really fancy. Nobody does, nobody did it before, even for this guitar. And the top is spruce because it's also made for drumming, for all this like crazy things and scratching and stuff. And you really want to make sure that that guitar would last for longer than for half a year because that's the difference between spruce and cedar. The spruce is actually easier to break and it just the pieces of wood would be flying off if you were doing things things like that. So uh, yeah that that was the whole idea too. And of course like some some simpler but effective pickup system, some detuning systems as I said. And eventually we created the guitar that's well that costs around one thousand three hundred euro. So in dollars it would be around the same price anyways. So uh, yes it's not exactly super affordable level it's not 300 euro guitar but at some point there was also not there was also not about just the features but also about the quality because well if you go with a lower price the quality might be uh, compromised and then some people would be really noticing things that you know something is uneven or the neck goes bendy after a couple of months or whatever and we really didn't want that because to me it's just very important that even though it's not the same guitar we've been really honest about it from the very beginning it's not the same guitar but it's a guitar based on my actual guitar that is actually playable and affordable and also on top of that i i play that guitar myself i have videos for that guitar have it at home and even though it's not my primary instrument for obvious reasons it doesn't have all these crazy systems but uh i it has my name on it and it implies that i this is my like a guarantee signature and that was very important that's why we took us almost like four or five years to actually create that guitar not only because of the covid and russian ukrainian war which is like a totally separate thing but also uh, just simply because i wanted to make sure that i'm would be proud and not ashamed you know that something is released and i know that it's not quite good enough and i would have to lie about it or i would have to pretend that yeah it's the best guitar in the world you know but at the same time it would be just some it wouldn't be it would not be the best i mean of course i mean it's, it's best or not the best is relative things especially in art but i think we did our best and i'm proud of it and i'm really happy to see that well when people send me videos of them playing this guitar and the whole idea is just to give them a nice vehicle for the start and then afterwards they can of course like install all these additional things, install additional pickups, do anything with it. And as I said, create something that might be loosely based on what I've been doing, but better and different. It doesn't have to be the same. It's better if it's different and, and better than what I do. Yeah, 100%, especially like you said, you have it behind, it's, it's your name on it. You wanna bring this quality product to your, your followers, people who, who know you, follow you, support you over the years. You want to make sure that they're getting a nice piece of equipment that they can have for a long time. Like you said, the neck doesn't warp, all that stuff. And I think for the price range, you know, like that's kind of that it's a solid price range in terms of like, it's like in that, like not, it's not entry level. It's like in that middle section, you know? So like, I feel like people who start playing guitar always get like a couple hundred dollar guitar. And then once they're, they've kind of, you know, gone through all those, the, the learning curves at the start, then they can kind of, you know, they can justify buying themselves something a little more expensive like that, you know, and I don't think it's, it's over, like I looked at, looked at the price and I was kind of actually surprised uh, where it's at, but can you make, is there an option where you can get six banjo tuner pegs or is it usually it's just the two? I saw you had two on the, 
two low notes and then a two high note one. Uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, actually we offer them only for two top notes, so for for the for the melody strings for the trebles. And uh, the thing is that I think theoretically you can just order it directly, uh, f for example through Tomann, which is what one of the biggest stores in Europe, and uh, the thing is that afterwards they still have to order the guitar directly from Baton Rouge. So it means that theoretically if you can just, if you, well, if you're ready to pay for six banjo tuning packs because it's going to be really expensive, it's just like the whole, the, the, every, uh, just one, one, one pack costs like around 100 20 euro I think so it's really really expensive so the whole pack would be almost 800 and uh, or like seven 700 to 800 so it's almost like it's more than it's almost like the whole guitar it's almost like the naked guitar but just just this tuning mechanisms uh, and of course it's like we were thinking that yeah for I mean for dedicated people it's still easier to get them through us because like at least we covered the customs and all this thing that uh, all this uh, shipping 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 from America, which also would be uh, in, would be doubling not really doubling the price, but I think if they cost would be costing eight hundred, you would have to pay one thousand two hundred or something like that. So it's going to be really really expensive, yeah. because of, especially for the here ta taxes and customs here in, in Europe. So it's still easier to order that from us. But from what I see from the sales, still most of the people tend to buy just naked guitar, which is totally fine too, because as I said like even this whole banjo tuning stuff even this two tuning systems not all the six strings but just two strings it already like you already have to convert your whole musical world into something else for example playing exclusively in alter tunings or playing in low tunings so it kind of really brings you pretty far already from what we learn as guitar players riffs or like songs in standard tuning is basically not really applicable in standard tunings so and not i mean you can find a way of course around it but i would i wouldn't I, like I, I don't use it in standard tuning you want to go lower you want to save strings you want to use open tunings and stuff and this is like totally different world that you need to that you have to explain or explore and uh it means that basically i also I guess that some of those people who might just get the naked guitar afterwards, they can order the systems from us later whenever they feel like they're ready for it, which is also cool. Yeah, hundred percent. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so maybe uh, we'll flip gears a little bit, but um, I noticed you're kind of into the hand pan these days or uh, so like, let's, let's get into that a bit. Cause that's a really cool instrument. And uh, yeah. So like, how did you get into to use in one of those. Yeah, I mean, actually, just let me, uh, just for the people who don't know what it, what it is, let me just quickly bring you, bring you one because it happens just to be here at home. So it's this big, huge thingy. Um, I mean, probably, I mean, most of the people have seen these things to some extent here and there on YouTube or on the streets, but they might not know the name exactly. So yeah, this 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 is the handpan by the company Kosmoskai. It's the, the Russian guys, really, really sweet people who just, well, build this instrument by hand. So everything is handcrafted. That's why these instruments are surprisingly expensive. They just, you, it's really hard to find the one cheaper than 1,000 euro, and uh, they can go all the way up to 5,000 or something like that, because even though it looks pretty simple, but it's not. It's two, well, half spheres of metal, of mm, usually it's nine, Neat traded steel or stainless steel, and uh, then afterwards you mold this shape, and then you have to basically build every note by hand, just tune it with a hammer like hundreds of hits until it's well, until everything is tuned. And because it's the same surface, all the notes should be well, kind of tuned correctly so the metal would not be moving and everything just so. But it sounds and uh, yeah, so the the whole thing is that um, I, I've been actually, uh, I had a project um, all the way from like 2016 or 15 when I was just starting playing in uh, in bars and local bars in my hometown when I just started my fingerstyle journey. And uh, I, I was working with a lot of local musicians and one of those musicians, my, my, my friend, uh, he was playing this, this type of instruments. And uh, that's when I got introduced to hand pans and also steel drums, which is also kind of a similar instrument to this, but a bit smaller. And uh, I was just, so uh, I I I kind of like the concept because it's it's an easy instrument to play. It's like um, in the professional world of musicians, it might be even considered people. I mean, this some professionals might be frowning upon over these instruments because it's just well, it's 
kind of, you don't have to learn much, you just can play a couple of patterns and everything sounds in tune, everything sounds good, there's no way to hit a wrong note, and you just basically need some very basic technique and very basic understanding of left, right, left, right pattern, and you would already would be able to create some, uh, how do you say, well, randomly beautiful music. It's like, it's not, it's already going to be beautiful, the question is not going to be structured or anything, but everything would be in tune, everything would be beautiful. And um, this is something that I also wanted to explore, because I, I it, it's not like learning a new instrument especially when you're a fingerstyle player so all these patterns all this hand separation is already there i've been doing that for so many years on guitar and i can do them i mean i can basically do a lot of things separately i mean i know how to learn these patterns right so it's like if, if i have to play something here with one hand and something here with the other hand i know how to approach it and i know how to make it quick so it means that this i can apply the same contact uh, concepts to handpan and basically play fingerstyle on it because i can do bass i can do drums i can do amplification as well there are pickups for this thing and at the same time i don't need to spend years learning the instrument like for example trying to do the same thing on a piano because that's a, on real drums because that's what it, i mean that's where you have to sit for hours and play and play and play for this instrument of course you also have to put some time in it but there's just 18 notes and most of the time it's just nine notes or 10 notes so basically it's it's still the learning curve is much shorter so of course i mean it takes the whole lifetime to master and to become like a real well expert and the real professional but i don't consider myself to be like 100 percent handpan player just people love it on the internet and i enjoy doing this like short videos and bits and i think it also uh brings something new and exciting during the live show so i just have one song that i play on a well steel drum similar to this one um and uh, i think it also spices things up so much because out of like aside from all these guitar things and crazy guitar things that's happening out of a sudden you just take this thing and show the steel drum to the people and like ask them what it is and then you just amplify it because you can also well, put piezo pickups inside of it and you can put it through your favorite Strymon effects right through your reverbs and delays and make it sound bigger than life and then you just play some nice decomposed song which is also my goal so even though these instruments are usually being referred to as intuitive instruments, it means that actually it's not bad that it's easy to play it means that you can actually give it for to your child to your, like one year old child and there already would be some music happening. Even if you randomly bash it, everything would be sounding, well, harmonically pleasing. <laughs> so it actually, it's, it's not a bad thing that instruments like that exist. Not every instrument should be like, should be having like a many years of the learning curve, right? It's a, uh, but at the same time, it's really f interesting to take this nine or 10 or 15 notes, how many you have on this instrument and to compose a composition without any improvisations, with a structure, with bass, with melody, with separation, with drums, and all of that stuff is so closely connected to fingerstyle, so sometimes it feels like you're not even playing a new instrument. You just kind of take your fingerstyle brain and you just put it here and everything instantly works. And even the technique is the slap harmonic thing, it's something that we've been doing for years on the guitar. It's exactly the same thing that you do on a handpan, and uh, it works beautifully. So I, I, I think of that as a nice little venture outside the fingerstyle world, and also another way to popular, uh, to make this instrument more popular within the community that's not necessarily interested in this instrument. Because again, I do it because I have fun with it. I have so much fun with it, to the extent that I just compose music and do videos out of my own will. I mean, nobody pays me for that or something. So uh, I just uh, think it's fun to bring some new instrument to people who not necessarily know what it is but who might be interesting interested to explore it. No, and I think that's real I think that's super cool that even though you're, you know, you're primarily known as this fingerstyle guitarist, you're still willing to kind of change up not change up your content but add some content in there that's like you said it's a different instrument altogether. Um but at the same time it's still you just doing what you love and I think that's that's pretty cool man and like you know talking to like different uh, content creators and musicians like the successful people are the people who stick to what they like they are the niche you know and like you, you were talking about like you, you're in these niches so like this is part of your not like brand but like your niche you know like and i've seen it i don't know how many videos i think i saw at least one where you were playing guitar and the the hand pan at the same time so that the <laughs> <laughs> that's that's very logical, right? I mean, it's just it's just the next logical step to do it. But actually, it's, it's funny that you mentioned this whole well, niche thing. Is that I believe that, for example, it's like it's it's always nice at some point, especially when you become more or less professional. Not really like I don't know am I whether I'm professional or not, but I'm just saying like if you already see that you've been good at something, is yeah, it's indeed it's very important to hit the same spot 
over and over again. So if you know that, well, you seem to be good at fingerstyle guitar, then yeah, you hit it, hit the spot for many years very consistently until you feel that you that that uh, until you see the results because the results are gonna come. The question is when. Maybe in a year, maybe in ten years, but they inev they inevitably would come because the hard work plus luck, right? You already put the hard work, and then you just gotta hope that luck at the right time, the right place is gonna happen sometime soon on the way. But you have to really well work hard. And the thing is that yeah, I've been doing exactly that with fingerstyle guitar and. Uh, at the same time, I understand that no matter how much I love John Gom or like Petter Isariola or vocal based or rap based music, because I'm a big fan of rap and all this kind of non guitar stuff, I just know that my vocal abilities they are not there. They not I'm not that let's say inclined to these things. Not because I, I don't I don't like to talk about talent thing, you know, like for example, oh, you know, I'm just musically talented. This is easy for me, and vocals are not easy or whatever. Anybody can learn things to some extent might not be to the world class extent but to a very good extent but at the same time i just see that it's much more fun for me to explore these weird things and nerdy things and install new things in my guitar and play handpan than to practice vocals because if i would spend five ten years practicing vocals i might not be becoming ed sheeran but i would be probably able to sing better than i do now but at the same time i just see that i'm not that super interested in that if you're not that super dedicated and if you don't feel like you would be doing that for 10 years to come then probably it's it's the it's goes too far away from the, that spot that you would want to hit. And at the same time, I just find it's really fun with handpan because I'm still hitting the same fingerstyle spot. If it's a totally different audience and everything, but it's it's the same kind of thing that you can... Um, it's the same idea, the same concept, that you, how you can make it accessible. You can just play some cover song on it, but you can use some drums like you do in fingerstyle. And you can record it in a fancy way like you do it in fingerstyle through pickups, not just through microphones, to create some unique tone that would be recognizable instantly, even though you'd see your second handpan video, because I think my tone is already, well, pretty electric. <laughs> Compared to other like well famous um, uh, handpan players, even though I'm not, I don't consider myself to be fingerstyle uh, handpan players. That I'm still looking up to a lot of people who have been doing that for years. Because obviously, if you see check some really professional handpan guys, you would see that well, well, these guys really know what they're doing, and I'm just well playing around. But uh, I'm just saying that to me, it doesn't even feel like a great like a big venture. It feels like it's just something that also comes naturally, and also I can combine with my guitar, and also I, obviously I see that I. Uh, I'm I'm good at what I learned on the guitar, and I can instantly apply it to handpan, and I'm not going to be that bad at it. How I would be, for example, at piano, because I would know that for piano I would have to take ten years to oh five years to learn how to play at least something proper. But here, because I have all this guitar knowledge, I can almost instantly create some music. And if I spend a couple of years on it, I might be even good at it. No, that's that's great, and I think it was uh, you had mentioned the the rap, how you enjoy rap, and I think probably one of your more viral videos was when you did the real Slim Shady, right? Because I know that's when I got introduced to you, so it's kind of funny, you know, you do something just like right up your alley, and then you gotta get a big boost of like virality from it. So that let's talk about that video actually. I think that video is actually so cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's like uh, it, it was during my COVID days. It's when the COVID hit, when the concert got can, concerts got canceled and everything, and I just found myself at home for months, just not even knowing what to do because I also had like this weird, weird stage of my musical creativity back then that I felt like I don't know, I, I like I have no inspiration to compose music anymore because I just released my uh, al my third solo album in 2019 and then in 2020 20, there was COVID and I literally had no idea what to do now it's just because I, it felt like I gave gave out so much of this creative energy to that music that I already released so I didn't even know where to move and I started to try this and that and that and that just to see where I can uh, how I can how how I uh, the, the way how not to get bored basically how not to stop playing at all and just switch to something else and uh, that's that's where my passion to rap well came into play and I was thinking whoa okay cool I mean I can, I can just play this stuff on guitar and try to rap on top and it's funny that that video that you're talking about it was just recorded in my room it was a, I guess it was 200th take but still it was just well it was all live and everything just really like dirt cheap just on the phone and uh, and it kind of went vir viral and every time i look at the uh, I watch this video like when it pops up again or even when i re-upload it it's uh, it's like I'm, I'm cringing a bit because it's obviously just it's not really well practiced it's just i mean i'm speeding things up and the accent just ah, goes through and i'm like oh i cannot really listen to it but the thing is despite all these things it's like i i analyze it as a musician right as a person who knows how to make it better next time but at the same time this video has this authenticity factor that for example the properly recorded version afterwards that i did like in half a year or something there was the whole eminem medley that i did it was just the real some shady that one short video but then afterwards i did the whole 
nicely studio produced version of Eminem Medley when I played the Lose Yourself, uh, Real Slim Shady and Stan, so one of my favorite songs, and the Real Slim Shady was in the middle, and I really made, wanted to make sure that it sounds better than that uh, homemade recording, so I really worked on the accent, I really worked on the rhythmics and everything, so it, it just in general, musically, it sounds much better, it sounds much more professional, and it got some nice views, but not compared to that video, to that the couch video, and I'm just thinking that it's like, it, the, some of these videos have this authenticity factor that makes people you make makes makes people connect to it and watch it and send it to friends and uh, have some emotion about it because it's like and this is something that you cannot control that's the biggest problem it's like if i would know how to make my videos more authentic or how to make them more viral or whatever i would definitely would be putting this authenticity in every one of them but i don't know it's just like you pr keep producing videos you keep producing content and then some of them just blow up and you have no idea why it's like if, even though Technically, you see that this is not as good as the other video that she did with the same song, but that video has this magic. I mean, not is it not in esoterical way, but as I said, this uh, all the factors of authenticity, right place, right time, and everything combined together. That that video went went, went viral, and every time, for example, when I re-upload it on TikTok once in a couple of months, it gets at least like you know one hundred thousand views. It's the same old video that I just re-uploaded. I just know that it has this magic, and this magic is really never goes away, which is kind of fun to think and basically the whole idea is that you make 200 videos and if five out of this 200 would be having this authenticity factor you can just re-upload them time and time and time again and people are still going to be enjoying them and watching them and there would be new people keep finding you well but for that you need to do 200 videos first so that's the that's the hardest part it's really hard to keep that well to keep this magic consistent because i don't even know how it happens sometimes it's just there sometimes it's not yeah and i it, yeah i think there's just something better right? you have your hood on dark room and you're just kind of you're going but it's it's really well made and um i was talking to mike about that uh, mike dawes um and he was I've, i kind of lost my train of thought here but i think for him he was talking about you know when he he does things on uh his acoustic it's like he can do it like without all that production value or with the production value right like where you say you're doing all the editing and for myself i kind of prefer watching a youtube video like that where it's like there's not too much mixing done on the on this the sound and i understand like sometimes you need to have all this mixing but i i, I prefer like those street performances right where it's kind of like raw and authentic because there is something about it right you're like wow this is just bare bones uh clean and clear there's no there's no movie magic and not that you know something that's been mixed is there's movie magic or anything but it's there's just like you said there's just something about that authenticity that pe that's people enjoy you know i, I think it also might uh, it also should not be perfect because the thing is that nowadays you can imitate anything so i mean i could just re-record everything beforehand and i could just record myself sitting on that couch pretending that it's live right just uh, writing that it's live but in fact i just re-recorded everything afterwards in studio and I just put some this ambience effect of the room to make it look like i'm doing it live i mean there are so many ways how you can trick the listener or it's not going to be clear whether it's really played live or not but uh most of the time i think it's it's not even about that whether you're tricking or not whether it's like instantly clear that it's there at the moment or not uh, i think it's something different it's like I, as i said i don't even know it's like this magic thing that might be the song choice might be the way how you move might be the way how you well i don't know play things might be the way even when the, that video was uploaded i don't know they just i mean this whole social media thing is just it's, it's a crazy world it's like i also know that mike was uh, go, going viral in 2013 and 14 it's like basically he, he was his videos were really really big back then and he also was i think he kind of got lucky because he just needed well two or three great videos to set up his touring career and well for, for years to come which I'm, I'm really happy for him so he doesn't have to produce the content like crazy i mean nobody has to do it but uh, it feels like the consistency now in the social media world means more than anything else and on top of that it's uh, on top of that it's been exhausting and blah 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 it's like even the views value is not as it used to be before because back then when you were just going viral on youtube it used to be a big thing it's like oh this is everybody was talking about it like andy mckee was drifting in 2006 and you instantly set up your whole career but nowadays i i, I literally got this like 10 million of views on TikTok on my handpan playing this Linkin Park thing, like this video that I uploaded lately, and just, it, it, that, that video had magic, it's, it's not live, but it had magic, it's just people started, the people like still watching that, it's just 10 million of views on TikTok, 2 million views on Instagram, it's like crazy, I mean, I'm, I was thinking, like, why people don't watch my guitar videos so, uh, so <laughs> eagerly, right, I mean, <laughs> just, just, I've been like, I'm putting so much time and effort into guitar stuff, and it's just second video on handpan in 10 millions of views on TikTok, but, 
guess what? It didn't kickstart my hand pen career. I I am not playing at every hand pen festival at this point. I'm not like you know it, that, that's the thing. I mean, this whole views value is just you don't even know what it means anymore. It feels like okay, well you have these views, but what to do with them? It's like really have no idea so that's why i mean the world is changing so much this whole social media thing is changing so much so it's even having these views is not that impressive so i think like having the consistency is much more impressive so the, the if, if you keep doing that for years for decades to come then yes you would build a name for yourself but if just one video goes viral or two or three it might not be enough anymore yeah, I, I I could feel that a lot. And um, like for myself, you know, I, I got into I'd done some like different like e-commerce, different little things for online businesses. And I was like, man, like I love playing guitar, you know, like um, unfortunately, I would never for myself. I don't feel like I could ever make a career of playing. Um, so I'm trying to find this like niche for myself, build out this niche. Right. And um, I don't like um, so on. I make shorts where I go up to. So I walk down the streets like in my hometown there and I just ask if someone play. If, like, hey, do you play guitar? And if they play, then like I'll get them. I'll shoot a quick video of them playing. And like so I've been making like YouTube shorts like that. So something that's like kind of alive and on the spot that's raw. And, you know, I just use this extra phone glued to the guitar, you know, like that's the extent of my um, my mixing and recording, you know. So, uh, you know, but I, I can see the evolution over time. And I'm just trying to mention like, I you know, I did. I thought maybe I shot like 10 of them and I'm like, okay, you know, this is great. And I'm like, now I'm on episode 60 something, you know, and it's like, okay, I'm still, you know, I've, I've amassed, I think a hundred thousand on TikTok, like 35 on, on Instagram, 35,000 followers. So, you know, it's a nice follower base. Um, but you know, it's like, where do you go from there? Right. So I have to continue, um, building these, this niche out like you're talking about. And that's why I'm doing these interviews because I want to talk to musicians. I want to talk to them about their, social media side of things see like what it takes like how they navigate the space right because social media is huge right now in terms of like making a name for yourself like you said before you could just post a couple videos that go well and then you could set up your whole touring career and for yourself you know you're still grinding it out posting like high quality videos um you know introducing all these different techniques really trying to make a name for yourself and it's like it seems like it's a non-stop it's like a never ending kind of cycle of having to keep pushing. Right. But for yourself, like you're, you're 26, right? You're 26, you're 26 years old and you've already built out uh, quite a few uh, income streams from playing guitar. And it's not luck, like you said, cause, and you mentioned that, sorry, I'm going on a little ramble spree here, but uh, <laughs> it, it'll, it'll go somewhere. Uh, you'd mentioned, um, uh, you know, talent, but it's not really talent, right? It's skill because you've built that over the course of like, however many years you've been playing. Cause I would, the word talent, I, I mentioned it most of my podcasts when someone talks about talent, but um, like talent kind of takes away from the hard work. I think, you know what I mean? Cause you've been, cause I, when I saw your initial videos, I went back on your YouTube, you're very young, you know, and you're playing these, these songs and then to see the progression to now where, you know, you're going like crazy on the guitar and doing all this stuff. It's, it's a different, it's a different ball game now. Right. Cause you've put in that time. So I don't think it's, it's not talent, it's skill, you know? Yeah. Um, of course. So I don't know where I was going with that whole. I, I, that I, whole just, yeah, I just, I just wanted to like, well, well, like, just gonna catch you on that thought because at first, really, congrats on on, on the getting those views of, for for your uh, well, this uh, guitar thing, uh, live project for like. I, mean, it, I think it's like it should be really admirable and should really be proud of yourself because, as I said, my following it has been built throughout the years and also through the golden years of YouTube or internet, 2015, 16, when it was easy to get views. Well, relatively easy compared to now. And uh, and if you're doing this now, let's say in the past like couple of years or something when the social media is already so um, such a uh, such a dangerous place I mean it's, it's really survival of the fittest it's just I mean there are so many creators and some so much of a good quality content and I think just people they just have no time it's like you know you follow 300 YouTube channels and you see these notifications every day in your feed and you get really really picky about okay which videos I want to watch and how long they are and that's why I mean this, there's this whole tendency of uh, uh, people preferring to watch shorts or reels or right, something that gets shorter and shorter and shorter instead of uh, well investing in a long video or something if it's some news or politic based thing or something like that and uh, that's why I think it's well it's really well you really got to be proud of yourself that you managed to build this now not 10 years ago, because I said, if, 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 if I cannot imagine how much time it would take me if I would be starting just right now, even if I would be playing like right now already, right, without going through all this learning curve and stuff, how many years now it would take me to build this almost like whatever, I had 900,000 followers on YouTube, and it's like, and again, 
it doesn't mean that all these people watch my videos. It doesn't mean that every single video of mine gets 900,000 views. And this is also very funny that it's like during those golden years of YouTube, I was I remember the times and I was just like, okay, well, I, 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 I'm doing a cover now. If it doesn't get 1 million views on YouTube, it's kind of meh, uh, not that good. If I do an original song, it should get around 300,000 to 500,000. Can just imagine these numbers on an original song where it's not even might not be even something crazy happening, just some well, finger picking more or less. So, not like you know, all this <laughs> stuff. So, um, and nowadays, if you just check my views on YouTube, it's like 30,000. 40,000, 50,000, and it's like, I don't think I'm making content that's worse than I used to do used to do before. Might be a bit different, and I'm totally fine if some people well, don't like it anymore, because, well, I well I'm not, I'm, I cannot do the same thing for years, you know, like, the, it's, it's good that we all progress to somewhere and change things, and some old fans, well, they just leave you, some new fans come, it's totally fine, but not to the extent that people used to watch millions, used to bring millions of views, and now you just have 30,000, and it's not, it feels like, oh, your career is finished and something, but at the same time, the numbers are still growing, which is super weird, you see that all your followers actually keep growing, I'm gonna hit million followers on YouTube, I don't know, in half a year, in a year, I don't know, but they keep growing, it doesn't mean that my career is broken, that I went in the wrong direction or something, at the same time, I, I mean, I get these views on TikTok and everywhere else, but not on YouTube anymore because algorithms change so much. So I think just most of your people just don't even don't even get to see these videos. They don't even get notifications, or they just decide to watch something else over your videos because there's just too much stuff. And uh, you gotta be really strategic at the point of okay, what kind of video you want to upload. And this is something that I don't like to do because I think well, still art should be art, right? And if you feel like okay, this song deserves to be uploaded then while well, you want to upload that you don't want to really just tailor all your music and all your things to your audience needs because you still want to express yourself that's the, otherwise we're all going to be just doing blogger things when you will be just i don't know doing this how how they call this also very famous very, very popular format now when just guitar guys just call random strangers on the internet and they have their reactions on, on, on it's like i mean it's it's totally fine but the question is if you hit that direction you might be getting more views but the question is if promoters would be interested in booking you with this type of content for their festivals which is also you got to keep in mind for whom you do these videos and it might not only be for your audience but maybe for the people who might potentially want to well arrange a concert for you and they would really be happy to see that you're able to play full songs full songs tour <laughs> not <laughs> not the not, not not youtube shorts tour with 30 second beats and reactions you know so that's i mean no offense to all the people who do reactions it's, it's a totally different thing that's why i'm saying like being a touring musician with the internet based thing and at the same time uh and or being a blogger who just well puts his whole effort and time into his Social media is a different thing, I believe. And uh, you were also saying, well, the business side of things, it's like, yeah, I mean, I, be I believe it's a skill. Anything is a skill. And I would just say that, yeah, well, well the, the talent thing is also just, I don't know, really, really interesting topic because there's just so many opinions about it. I used to have the opinion that talent is just something that you kind, kind of predisposed a little bit. Like, let's say you have this 5% of a, um, of a, how do you say, of a boost compared to other person who is not talented. So it means that this 5% of the boost that you just catch, you just grasp something quicker. It doesn't even have to be musically related or something like that. But uh, it means that this boost will help you to be a bit faster when learning. But at the same time, if you're not hardworking enough, then that other person without that boost, he's going to reach you at some point and then, then go further because you 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 got lazy because you thought okay everything is easy for you and you would stop putting so much work in it that's why i think that's probably something that happens a lot in music schools and stuff like that when talented talented kids just don't take it that seriously because it seems that everything works out but then they really get to the high level and they start to compete right with people who were just grinding people who are grinding they still keep grinding and you got lazy because you thought that everything would be easy <laughs> so that's the whole thing but again music is very subjective so it's really hard to say what's talent and what's not here there are, i don't know it's like i think music is so hard to judge i wish it, i mean I, i'm happy that it's not like sport because in sport if you i don't know if you did not genetically build well enough for let's say bodybuilding you will never become a mr olympia no matter how hard you try because you're just not built for it unfortunately well gotta blame your mom and dad for that but you cannot do anything about it but for music it's like there are so many examples right i mean so many guitar players might be bashing like kurt cobain for not 
learn, not, not knowing how to play guitar properly, but that's what made his style so unique. And he wasn't even a guitar player. I mean, he he's not like he he wasn't even like he he was never positioning himself like oh look I'm, I I do crazy things on it right. He was just expressing himself himself in the way he could at that point of time with his level of skill. For some reason, it clicked so much that it just basically melted the whole world away uh, and just killed the whole well whatever was before before uh, before uh, grunge right hair metal whatever was there that, that, Jordan, that grunge killed back then in 1991 so um that's the thing it's like if you if you dissect whatever kurt cobain's talent was he a good guitar player no no what did he know a lot about theory or whatever no uh i don't know was he putting enough time into practicing no uh, obviously <laughs> but for some reason all of these things clicked in a way so he didn't need all that that, that, that that's the question so he 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 managed to i don't know to change the whole world just with three albums and that was enough so that, that i know who knows how things would be going who he would be still alive and and you can you can just well you can just put this perspective into any musician bloodhound gang is my favorite example is jimmy pop is is he you, you know bloodhound gang right no, I don't. It's the, I, unfortunately no. You don't know Bloodhound Gang. Oh, that's such a pity. It's a it's a great American <laughs> band. It's a, I mean, probably you know the song. Uh, you and me, baby, we ain't nothing but mammals. So let's do it like you do it on Discovery Channel. And they have a lot of other yeah. cool songs. And this is like this, they're very sarcastic and very sex sex based. And it's like kind of nasty, but witty at the same time. And singing is really really bad. And but I mean, they blew up and they're famous. And I love their music. Despite the fact that I understand that, okay, that might not be the best singing in the world. And at the same time, I might not be interested in listening to the best opera singer in the world, who is just much more uh, technically profound and everything, but I'm just not invested into it. I'm just not, well, interested. But at the same time, I would listen to somebody who sings kind of bad things about witty sex things, not because I'm a, I'm a stupid person. I mean, just, I mean, it, it, I mean I hope, hopefully I'm not stupid enough, but I'm just saying th this is something that there's, um, in, in music, there's something that grabs your attention uh, on a level that's really hard to explain. I wouldn't say it's an emotional level or something like that, but I just believe it's like a magic thing. You might even understand, okay, these lyrics are bad, the song structure is bad, these guys cannot play, but at the same time something makes you get back to that time and time again, there's something so attractive to it. You would call it a guilty pleasure, but no, it's not, because guilty pleasure is a false concept, right? If it, How it can be a guilty pleasure if it gives you pleasure? It means that it's worth it, it means that it has a value, right? So th th that's what I'm saying, and uh, I don't know what I was... What I was ah, yeah, the, t <laughs> the talent thing. So I'm just saying talent thing in music is such a thing so you don't even know how to explain that. I mean, sometimes you feel like you have to grind for 20 years to become good at the instrument, but sometimes it feels like you can blow up the whole internet and change the whole world if you have this unique combination of three chords and some profound lyrics and good people behind your back, like your bandmates, for example. So it's I, I, I don't even know. It's just so hard to even to no. give it the proper definition. would love to know what you think. Yeah, no, I no, I actually, I, I kind of agree with you. I know I mentioned, I think talent is skill, but I think you're right. There is people where they get that, that initial edge, that 5%. And then it's usually those people where it's not saying usually, but I say sometimes it's where they, it's easy for them. And then they, they kind of lack behind because those people who are pushing, 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 they get, they gain that skill. They build that skill of like pushing hard and like really, you know, building that foundation where it's at some point they will surpass you because they've, they've put in the time and uh, that, you know, that, that kind of, I think, happens with anything, right? Like even business, um, music, doesn't matter. What, like anything you want to do in life, you got you to gotta make sure you keep pushing, like have that constant pressure forward. Even content creation, right? You need to just consistently push, push, push. And at some point, maybe something will give. And uh, I, it's nice you're uh, talking about um, bodybuilding, actually, because um, for you, you're obviously like a pretty fit guy. Um, I, I love going to the gym too. And for you, like, is that primarily what you do is like bodybuilding exercises kind of thing or? Yeah. I mean, just, uh, it's, it's kind of, well, a lot of people will say it's useless. I mean, what do you need? What do you need it for when you're a musician? But it's like, it all started just from the simple fact that, yeah, I mean, we, we, when we, we are as musicians, we sit, we sit a lot, right? We just barely move. So it's just nice to move in general, no matter what you do, it doesn't have to be bodybuilding just i mean if, if you even if you just go out once in a day uh, for a small for a short stroll it's really better than to do nothing but i don't know but to me it's always been a passion since high school it started just because i wanted to impress a girl uh but uh, when i was like 16 or something but then i kind of loved this whole process and it just 
since then and, and then afterwards i was not really consistent about it but after covid i realized that okay now i have a bit more time and a bit more well, patience and motivation because I also started to get that pandemic fat when you just sit at home for too long and don't move and I'm just like okay well it's time to do something about it and I get back to gym and then since then I've been basically grinding non-stop for like more than four years already it changed quite a bit and uh, uh, well happy with my results and it just, just, it, it just another thing that structures my life just makes makes life more consistent because that's that's the word that you mentioned I think that's something that we can we, we can put everything else around the word consistency no matter what you do it's like kind of a habit building a habit of whatever habit of social of doing social media habit of uh producing content or music or whatever habit of going to gym like every day or no matter like how, how how often you want to do it but regularly right so and all of that in the long run would be giving you results inevitably so the question is that uh, well but, the, but for bodybuilding i i know for sure i'm not built in the way i, I like a professional bodybuilder so i will never become a professional but again do you have to be professional if you start something new do you always have to have this bigger goal of becoming the best no absolutely not if you if you enjoy it then just 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 do it whatever and that's why i'm thinking in general it's really nice when um when you're being as a musician especially like um being a professional right you will think okay i'm talking about consistency now i'm going to be contradicting myself uh it means that okay you you would want to probably spend eight hours a day keep practicing until the end of your life because you really want to be the best right it's like it's your profession it's like something you make your living off and it means that you really have to grind but at the same time it feels like you would lose so many good things about life it's totally fine to spend a week with your loved ones instead of practicing the world is not going to collapse because they're not practicing guitar for a week it's totally fine to well split your day in and enjoying some other hobbies even realizing that you're not going to be the best in the world in no matter what you're going to be taking because again it's not about the best in the world it's like i'm not even talking i'm, I'm talking like i'm the best in the world in guitar playing absolutely not i'm just well I'm, this is just something i make a living off and again, music is not about who's the best and who's who's the worst. But I'm just saying it's just uh, even though it's my priority and I still need to prioritize it, it doesn't mean that I want to go crazy about it. And I had this periods of time, in, like in 2017 or something, when things started to blow up, and I was thinking, okay, oh shit, I need to really um, play at least two hours a day or three hours a day because I really need to be in shape. I really need to be well to give all of, all of me to do my best. And uh, what what happens because of that? You just you feel constantly pressured you feel like you you're not living life you feel like you always keep that in mind oh i didn't do this i didn't do that and you have to do it every day and uh, i also heard this weird practices that some classical musicians do is that they for example have this six hours a day set for for practicing and if you don't hit the six hours today you for example you hit five hours it means that one more hour should go next day so it means you practice seven hours next day and then you know it's like it's it always been like it's like a huge depth in uh, for, for yourself and you just never cover it and at some point it's 12 hours or whatever because i mean there are days when you not would the way you would be missing these hours and it's like it would be just making you go crazy so that's that's what i'm saying the world is not going to collapse if you're going to spread your attention a little bit of course you still i mean not not I'm not talking about constantly switching to something else and doing that and, and to totally forgetting about your primary thing that you especially already see results and you might be already considering yourself to be talented in it, right? Because you you, you, you might be seeing this predisposition, right? I see that, I'm, that, I, that some things that I do on guitar is easy for me, whether because of practicing or because of my predispos predisp predisposition or something. And I feel like, okay, it makes sense to hit the same spot. It makes sense to grind the same spot, but it doesn't mean that I want to go crazy over that and spend eight hours a day grinding the same thing. I, I might get better as a musician, of course, but is it worth it sacrificing so many other things in your life? Sacrificing spending time with people that you love, sacrificing other hobbies, sacrificing exploring the world. And it's like, that's that's the big question. Because yeah, life is limited. We all, well, we don't have that much time to produce enough content right i mean you really gotta cook you really, you really gotta think okay well how many years realistically i have but still it's a lot of time i mean i'm 20 i'm just 26 now i if everything goes well and i'm not gonna die in a plane crash then i still have at least 40 years of music making it's like how many albums i can do it's like it's just crazy and doing bodybuilding or something like that would not hurt it would actually make me i guess a bit more diverse person it would make me a bit happier it would make this my stress 
being put into something else as a as a relief you know and something like that so and i and i actually like if, if i'm in a position to uh well suggest or advise people about something it's just not to be afraid to venture a little bit into other things just to try them out for 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 the sake of enjoyment because we all started playing guitar not because we had the ambition of becoming next best thing but because we just wanted to have fun with it for whatever reason play your favorite red hot chili peppers riff isn't that a great motivation yeah i think uh you hit in the head on the, the consistency for sure and for you you know being so consistent with guitar over the years you realize oh if i just put the consistent time into this and then you roll into bodybuilding you're like okay well if i keep being consistent with this i will have similar results where i will be getting you know i will progressively get better and better and then you're like you know you're learning better like better ways to lift the weights uh mind muscle connection and then oh i you know oh it's not just working out i need to be eating a certain amount of grams of protein per day and you know there's all those little um things you learn along the way and i think that's that's pretty cool man and it's like yeah so i get i asked this to all the people i've interviewed so in terms it could be your first um i don't know open my uh first like show you've ever you ever did when you were younger like how much money did you make from your first show uh, 20 euro i don't know 20 dollars <laughs> i don't know <laughs> something around that it's like the, the thing is that we also got a thing it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, i started playing in my hometown krasnodar it's in the southern part of russia so not too far from ukraine and from turkey and from the black sea so if you well well, I mean, Russia is huge, right? So we're talking about this western, western part, the closest to I mean, the most developed kind of part, and th that's why I just, well, I actually had a luck and privilege to be there in the first place because I, Krasnodar is a pretty big city, and uh, I also happen to have a, uh, well, family who were sustaining me uh, really nicely. I mean, my my mom and dad. So I initially i just had this possibility and opportunity to after 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 school not to think about how to for example help my mom deal with with I don't know, with financial things and working some other job, right? But I actually could put my time into practicing guitar or into video games, you know, into doing something that any other kid would love to do. Because this is something that I think being overlooked quite a, quite a lot, especially when we talk about talent. I'm just rambling again, but I just think it's a nice thought to, well, important thought to me to share that really got to be thankful and considerate of this circumstances that we all grew up. In, especially like people who were able or still able to do art from the very childhood. It means that you had this circumstances, comfortable circumstances around you, which is not everybody has. And that's the big problem because, I mean, there might be a person from a poorer family or from the country where it's problematic to upload videos on internet, whatever, if you like happen to live in North Korea or something like that, right? And it's like, uh, in, no matter how talented you are, you might be the next, next Beethoven or Mozart or whoever, or next Kurt Cobain, but your talent will never be explored. You would never even know that uh, that you're capable of such things because of sitting there at home in a comfortable environment after school, practicing guitar, noodling around, playing video games. Uh, you would you would have to you know grind for a family since the age of thirteen. So this is something that I think I gotta well thank my family and the circumstances around me that I actually well uh, were able to do it. Uh, without any additional stress and uh, so talking about that first show I started um, well playing things in my hometown and it was just local bars thing it's just especially and I never actually I was pretty shy about it so even when I was at school I was just playing here and there at some local events there but nothing much and I was kind of I don't know I was just a bit shy to share this thing because it happened in a way so I didn't really have I, I had I had friends but they were not musicians so there was really nobody to kind of appreciate truly uh, what, what I'm doing, you know, it's not, not in a way like, well, yeah, I guess it's cool, uh, but uh, in a way like, yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, I also play guitars, I mean, it's like really cool, let's play together, you know, like having this similar mindset that you can only have with another guitar player or with another musician who really understands how it all works and my my family is also not musical i mean they don't play instruments and well my mom used to play piano like a long time ago but she she like doesn't do it anymore so there was really i mean they were always been supportive they still supportive to this day but there was no really such thing as i felt like yeah i have the somebody to express what i learned because at some point when you start to learn proper things already when you already kind of have can kind of can play some songs right you really want to share it you really don't want to keep it to yourself and that's the question to whom you want to share that because if there are people around you who don't really care about it uh, then well it's, it's it's hard that's why that was the initial reason i started to upload things on the internet because well that's where i found all the 
uh, like-minded people. And uh, I mean, this whole conversation happens because of that, right? Because, well, in in inevitably people like you, you and me find each other at some point. So that, that's, that, that, that's, that's the beautiful thing, right? I mean, just we all can be connected through something so much more universal, universal than country borders on politics or religion and stuff like that. So this is something we always can nerd about for hours and be happy about, which is wonderful. And um, yeah, so basically uh, some videos started to go pretty viral. Uh, the first video, I'm not sure if you actually, probably you've seen that one, uh, it's called the guitar plus pan tapping song, is where I was playing the guitar with one hand and doing the pan tapping with another one. It's the old video from 2003, probably you saw it because it, it was the first viral thing in 2015. It got almost 1 million views on YouTube and to me it was a big success. I was still at school, I was like 16 and I was like, wow, cool. And that was actually super authentic and super raw. It was like live, one take in my room and um, it went viral but only in Russia and afterwards uh, I started to get off first to play in my city and I was thinking like oh wow it's cool finally career and then uh, it's it turns out that it was just noisy bars and then I instantly realized that okay there's so much work to do for example just in terms of amplification because you do all this fancy drumming on the guitar when you're just being mic'd up with an external microphone and um uh, everything and you don't have much of a string noise you just have this clicks and clacks and everything sounds just like somebody's clapping and this noisy bar and people more uh, people just care to eat and to drink and to talk with each other instead of listening to you like well i quickly realized this is not exactly my thing to play well this type of shows but again i had to play a lot of them and that's why i think when i got the initial experience in this re really harsh circumstances it's not the house concert when you play for your family when everybody's well supportive and everybody's looking at you and like you were a superstar no you're not you really have to grab the attention you really have to make them listen to you and by that you really have to do so many things good you have to well perform well you have to have a nice repertoire you have to have good sound you have to well communicate with people not just you know, not just to keep it to yourself being shy and everything so a lot of things of that i learned uh back then uh, when i was playing this bar shows and afterwards i switched to some more intimate venues but still in my hometown and uh, then after bigger successes on facebook and youtube uh, i started to get international bookings but then it was easier because uh, that was more or less regular concert halls or even bars but people were listening because they were because it was t it were the, the, those were ticketed concerts and business wise it was also really interesting because i obviously the first three four five years of international traveling uh, i did everything by myself so i didn't have manager and it means that i had to figure out by myself what would be my fee <laughs> what would be the money and uh, and th that's th I, I don't know for some reason I, I retrospectively i think i could ask mike about it or i can ask john about it i could ask anybody else of my peers but i, I don't know I'm probably was shy or something and i just didn't think about it much and i was just thinking okay well if if like let's say regular um, regular monthly salary in my hometown would be around well back then let's say 30 to forty thousand rubles which would be well to, n to nowadays money it would be around 300 euro and three hundred dollars i was just thinking okay well probably for europe it's not that much but actually it's not much at all <laughs> but, but the whole idea right. is that you travel to there you play those concerts for 200 euro for 300 euro and then you go back home and you reach and that's the whole thing it's like that that was the perfect situation right you just you, you and at the same time you also don't have this i that i always felt this uncomfortable thing when you have to well negotiate your fee because, I mean, you don't want to act like you're, you know, like you're asking for too much because it, you might come across a bit, I don't know, self-absorbed or whatever. Or, but at the same time, of course, if you ask for a little money, nobody would be paying you more because everybody will know why. If you're already okay with the 300 euro, why would we be paying you 1,000? Even though we, maybe we planned to pay you 1,000, but he's okay with 300. <laughs> so that's the whole thing. So, uh, but still, it was all right because, I mean, of course, like during the years, I realized that, okay, the fee should be bigger. And then I got, I started to work with my manager who's handling all my offers now. And thanks God, I don't need to, well, thanks to his help, I really don't need to go into negotiations anymore because I still would feel so uncomfortable. Like, like I mean, because asking for, 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 I don't know, negotiating fee is the worst thing, because I don't, I don't know, I, it's better if somebody, somebody else does it for me. And, um, yeah, but that's, that's how it started. And that's, and through many years, I felt really comfortable. I was still studying in the university back then. I was traveling from time to time to Europe, to America, to, to Asia, playing concerts there. I already had a couple of CDs back then. I was selling merch. The money were really good. And, uh, yeah, but then, I mean, 
maybe life would be keep going like that uh well but only until the point when the war happened when i realized that okay well things things uh, i mean I, ca I cannot stay in my country anymore i uh, had to leave and now well i'm for for already like for 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 more than a year i'm building my well real proper settled life here in germany i mean i've been here many many times before i've been spending i've been spending a lot of time here touring and stuff so it's not like you know something totally new to me but what's new to me is that i'm basically here permanently which is actually makes me so happy because most of the time when you have to travel all the time it's really nice to have some place that's not a hotel where you can just put your things down in the corner and you know that you don't need to pack them again in a week like all of them until every single thing is clean in the room so the room is totally empty and looks liminal you know that, that, that that's the thing so it's like that that's that's something that still makes me feel so comfortable inside that you know that if i go somewhere if i travel to somewhere somewhere i get back home and my things are here it's like i don't need to start all over again in a new hotel room or airbnb and I had to do it a lot because, well, the, the war thing really complicated life of, well, Russian and Ukrainian citizens citizens drastically. And, yeah, that was a really, really terrible time. I mean, still terrible time. The war still keeps going. And, of, of course, like, I'm, I'm, I'm very much against it. I'm like, writing posts about it. I'm trying to be, I have to be political about it because it's all, it's all affected lives of everybody. It's not some topic that I decide to talk about because I'm interested in politics. It's just because I have to, because it's considering it considers it, it affects me and my family and my friends directly so i well i could not be silent about it even though i was silent about it for quite some time while i was still in russia because it's fucking scary but uh the same, but but while i'm here i feel like i well i have to talk more about it that's why there was a song that i play during my shows where i uh uh, talk about it uh the war and not not in a cheesy way like oh yeah war is bad and everything but more in a personal way like uh, telling people that yeah, I mean it's really been affecting me and my family, and despite everything that's has been happening there, there are still a lot of people in my country which are against it, but they cannot leave for whatever reason. Some people have families, some people have jobs, some people just don't have enough resources to do it, and they still have to be there and have to live. Some well, they have to well, I don't know, live under these circumstances and make their life. Well, workable in a way and to say nothing about ukrainian people i mean ukrainian people obviously were going through so much so much worse yeah 100 that yeah that's wild i can't even imagine man and like it's good that you know you have this follower base where you can you know have an active voice and really push against like push against it and kind of i guess bring bring it up because right there's probably people around the world that don't see it and they probably think there's a lot of russians where they're 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 for what's happening right but it's like it's nice to have you know individuals like yourself where you're you're going to be vocal about that and be like really against that you know um and push against it which i think is is you know uh admiral um uh, like admire i don't know what the, what the fuck the word is for that but uh, admiral admirable yeah admirable there we go i'm the i'm the the uh native english speaker here um uh, <laughs> yeah uh what about um yeah i guess living in germany so how has that been like uh so like you obviously probably speak german at this point or yeah i mean my, my, yeah i've been i've been obviously preparing for 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 the whole thing and uh i've been studying with a with a private tutor for like well, three years already and uh, that, that's why i mean i i when i was moving to here i already could, could speak a little bit and now i may think well i'm not as good in german as it's in English by far, but I well I can do casual conversations. It's just gonna be some more mistakes and some weird things happening with my grammar. But uh, I'm, I'm I'm of course like I'm I'm here and I'm doing my concerts in German as well, so which is like really exciting. I mean I just I, I just love languages in general. What I was studying at the university was actually linguistics. So uh, uh, because oh. again that's another cultural thing. Nobody really believes that you can make it as a musician. So it's better if you take some kind of a safer route. If you learn something that might be more applicable in your normal life and since i was kind of good at languages from well from school starting from my school years uh we were just well me and my family was we were thinking that yeah i mean yeah well, let's try linguistics then and then we'll see how it goes so maybe theoretically i could do music from the very beginning from the very start but well that's how life went and i still, I still got my bachelor's degree there um, i wasn't the best student because i had to travel a lot and i was lazy but uh yeah but that's 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 the education i have <laughs> i'm a linguist i'm not a musician Oh, that's that's pretty cool, man. And I guess, yeah, taking private lessons probably helps a lot. Like, see, my my wife's South Korean, and uh, 
you know, over the last couple of years, we went to, you know, Korea a couple of times. We got married in Korea. And, um, you know, myself just trying to learn a little bit of Korean here and there. It's hard, you know, like learning a, like a, a for you, I'm assuming it's a third language learning German for myself. You know, I speak English, French, and now I'm trying to speak Korean a little bit, you know, and it's, it's hard to add to the repertoire, especially for myself. But like, luckily I learned, uh, like French when I was a, a young kid. So I was, I was lucky to have that introduced when I was young. It's like, I think as a kid, it's very not easy, but you don't really know what's going on. You kind of just learning when you get older, like, uh, myself or yourself, like you actually have to like dedicate that time and that resource and like actively be learning. Um, so I think it's pretty cool, man, that you're, you're pushing yourself to learn German. And I remember your Ted talk, actually, uh, I remember your Ted talk. I watched your Ted talk in the last two weeks too. Sorry. The cringe talk. It was, uh, I'm, not, I'm not happy about it. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was cool to see like uh, the progression in the last couple. I don't know how many years ago that was, but um, it was 2017, I think. It was like six years, seven years, almost seven years, I guess. Yeah, like to see the difference in your, like obviously your English speaking from then to now, it's like night and day, right? It's pretty impressive. But uh, so in terms of that that talk, like you already had your YouTube channel, I'm assuming at that point. So did that impact your follower base, like the TED talk itself or the, sorry, the, Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I just, I, I think it's still like a sweet memory. I mean, I just, I cannot really rewatch it. It's just, it's kind of like, ah, oh, I don't know, because there were also the sound problems. That's, I mean, it sounds so bad. It's like, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what was happening there, but it really sounds like a bad electric guitar. And I just, could not get over that sound even though there at the venue everything sounded good i mean we sound checked everything and i think the people there were really happy and i think it was still pretty authentic in the way how i was talking yeah i was super nervous and everything and it was a bit clumsy but i mean that's all of what i could do it just i mean it's weird to be cringy about uh, to cringing to be cringing about these old things in the past because that was the maximum i could do back then and the only thing i can learn from that is just to do better now i mean that's that's normal progression but i'm just saying that um yeah, I mean, I'm just not happy about the sound. I think it's not really represents what I wanted to show, at least uh, through the video. Still, it got one more than one million views. I'm like, oh, cool, okay, well, not bad. And uh, but yeah, you you're saying how it affected anything? I don't think it actually affects anything. It's like uh, it's cool that I have it. Um, I would love to do another one, but well, obviously at my level now, so I could do the same exact thing, but just better, and uh, and also maybe like prepare better record better so i could well use it as a content right because you don't want to miss the opportunity to make a content out of it to split it into 300 reels <laughs> but uh yeah but i'm just saying that uh, i don't think things like that affect career your career much in general not only tech talk but if even if we talk about talent shows like whatever voice america's got talent whatever like that if you i think okay i mean maybe for america's got talent you might get some new people get to know about you if you just been there once or some late night jimmy kimmel stuff right you if, if you're there just once at 12 at night or something yeah maybe 100 200 new people is gonna follow you gonna find you but it's not gonna change your life much i think to really get some following from this type of shows you have to perform there at least two three four times so to get to semi-finals of america's got talent or something like that that's when people really start to recognize you and start to remember you and you become a big thing but one one time appearance i think even on the biggest tv channel uh late like the super like popular late night show i think it's not it's not going to be giving you much unless if, i mean it, it still gives you this opportunity to brag about it you can even put it in your bio somewhere that you were there you know at some late the famous tv show or something like that but practically it's not really bringing you much but i mean the more reasons you have to brag about then i guess it's better because it's like when when, when people doesn't know don't know who you are then they might be reading your bio and they would be just thinking oh oh so he was there that show that i know it means that probably well he's a big thing because that show is a big thing you know it's this logical connection i'm not saying that well it's it's i'm not saying that you have to lie about it but uh, it's more more of this kind of promotional thing than really practical thing i don't think you would get much from it at least i i don't feel like getting it i got anything from it and what about like the um when you won the best acoustic guitar player award in 2018 like how did, did that i know you won like a a guitar and you got a string deal or something. I wrote that down. You won a Takamine guitar and then you got a one year Ernie Ball string endorsement. Um, so like, did that 
affect your career at all or well it, it, it was a, it was a nice reason to, to meet up with my friends because we were competing there with Kasper Esman and Kalein Langedijk it's a really great fingerstyle players as well we all knew each other as well so it's just like it didn't even feel like competition the community is so small so it's like no matter where you go it's the same people all the time and you're all friends and you all well even if you haven't seen each other in person you probably follow each other on the internet anyways and <laughs> it's like the community is really small and that was really nice to well catch up with the guys and the mike was also judging there which is really nice well, to meet mike and john was there i mean john Gaum was there as well so all the all the uk greats and um it was it was nice experience i mean I'm, I'm i don't consider this to be something really big because it's supposed to be uh not 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 really it's like how 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 they were putting it it's not like the, the best acoustic guitarist in the world or something because we were not competing there with mike or with like tommy emmanuel or something like that it was more like intermediate like kind of hobbyist uh, guitarist competition so that's why i don't know I, I don't remember i think i just wanted to i i, I think i just applied for fun and uh, and all the guys as well because casper and caroline they're also we all had have had careers at that point of time we're already releasing albums and doing videos on youtube so it's like we're not really like hobbyists that's the thing so it's not i mean the whole concept is a bit kind of i don't know not really precise because i mean acoustic guitars of the year it sounds so so cool but in, but i mean it sounds cool for your bio but in fact like it was just nice friendly meeting when i don't like i mean okay i won but it's like i i just we had so much fun there and it was such a good memory and there was it was not 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 a feeling like oh i have to win now because it's the most important competition in my life no it was just i, I felt like it's just nice uh, reason to visit the uk for the first time to meet up with mike to meet up with the guys to just have some good time and that takamine guitar uh it's like or takamini i'm not sure how it's correctly pronounced but anyways i never got it they could not send it to me back to russia they tried the two times and also it was right-handed so it's like that okay <laughs> and, and they that's a huge thing yeah 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 but, the, but i mean i can play right-handed guitars too i mean just well because you, as a lefty you never get to to hold a left-handed guitar at any party or with, at any other person's place unless if that person is lefty as well so that's why you have to learn to play inverted guitar as well but i'm just saying that they couldn't even send it to me but there were some postal problems i don't remember they tried two times and then we just like ah whatever <laughs> so i didn't even get the guitar that's cheesy that's uh it's funny yeah you mentioned the left-handed guitar i when i was doing my videos they're asking people on the street the first guy i asked sorry it's second person it was so lucky that I asked the first guy, he said, no, second person I asked, like, for the first video ever, he said yes, and then he flipped the guitar, and he was a left-handed, but he played it, he played it inverted, and I thought it was so cool. Uh, he, could, he could play it inverted, right? Yeah, he, yeah. Oh, that, he that's amazing, yeah, yeah, that's really lovely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, it's, it, so it, well. it's, it's much. It's, it's, really it's actually much easier than you think because sometimes people think that as a lefty, you want to play, the, if you play it like that, you want to play it like that, but it's not like that it's just inverted so it means that you just have to learn new shapes you just have to mirror the shapes and everything else is kind of playable it's not like you invert the whole thing and you have zero technique in this hand and zero technique in this hand and you just have to start this whole long like long lasting journey from scratch but no we just well it's 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 much easier i think just if, if you spend a couple of hours just playing inverted guitar it really becomes understandable what's happening there i mean may, you might not be able to play some complicated things but strumming chords and playing like wonderwall easy <laughs> that's all you need really yeah <laughs> um all right i got i got like one more for you i was talking uh, we we're talking about like monetizing yourself you know i was check i was checking through your uh your website so you got your live sh like you have your live shows you have your tabs that you sell you have your guitar courses your album sales uh, your gear, your signature guitar, your capo, your tone wood amp, which I think is pretty cool. I think Mike also has a deal with them, right? Or, yeah. And then you have your apparel, mugs, notebooks, different things. So, um, yeah, like that's pretty significant amount. Like I was talking about like these like income streams. Do you have any like future plans right now? Yeah, I know you were talking about maybe recording some like courses and different things, but are you or are you just kind of focused on doing your live shows? Well, I would say that the biggest money you would still get from uh, live shows. Uh, but my whole idea for the next whatever, maybe until I get until I get to thirty, I, I'm just thinking I would uh, much rather put a lot much more effort as I did before into creating the good passive income because it's like again it's like the whole thing of being a solo musician nowadays. You have to do merch, you have to do social media, you have to do everything that's around your music, right? Teaching tabs, whatever, anything, Patreon, some stuff like that. Something that I still haven't haven't yet. That is something I still yet to start because I I would love to. There was just always something that gets in the way and. 
And uh, the thing is that when you have the small pieces of income from all of these things, eventually you see that, oh, wow, I get like whatever. Well, at least that's the goal to have like whatever, two, three, four thousand per month just from this. So at some point you might be thinking that, OK, cool. I mean, if I want to stay at home for half a year, not doing any concert, just focusing on my album or whatever, just going fishing for half a year, <laughs> not doing anything else, you can absolutely do that. And that, that, I think that's the cool thing when you really feel like you're free of any well, not really obligations, but you know what? You don't have to worry about, oh, I have to pay my bills next month. I have to play a show and stuff like that. So I think this is like something that, and and this passive income should be created from as many resources as possible because maybe each of them are not really consistent in its own way, right? For example, if you do a video course, it doesn't necessarily mean that, whatever, 20 people would be buying it every month. So it would be giving you this stable, I don't know, 600 every month. No, I mean, it might be 10 this month and might be two next month. The same goes for like signature guitar percentage that I get. It might be many guitars this month, not that many next month. So it's also something that you cannot just rely completely or tabs or anything else. It's not like you can, you know, rely on specific numbers every single month. It's just not a stable. But when you have many of these things, it's it means that they would... Oh, like, of course, I mean, the, the, another important thing, I just forgot about it, of course, like Spotify, Apple Music, all the streams of your music, which is also important. You, you have to constantly uploading, you have to keep uploading your music on all the services because that's where people listen to you and that's where you slowly but surely grow your well, monthly following as well, and the more listeners you have there, the more money you, you have. And also YouTube ads as well. So it's like, not, not, not the paid YouTube ads when you uh, advertise some video game, but this automatic ads, which you also get money from. It, it, that's why it's in your interest to bring more people watch your YouTube channel, because then the more people see these ads and you get more money. So it's already like whatever, five, six, seven different uh, different sources that you just combine to Patreon. Also, Patreon is a great thing. I mean, this is something that I haven't explored yet. I would love, I mean, probably I'm going to start my Patreon like this month or next month. Everything is pretty much set, which is also a great thing in many regards, right? You just basically offer people a wide selection of so-called tiers that you can... Uh, offer right for example like whatever for five bucks you just get some preview of new content for 10 bucks you get tab for 50 bucks you get a private video lesson recorded for 100 bucks you get a private in person video lesson once in a month whatever you can come up like with all sorts of things that would also bring these people who already follow you to a much well, closer place in your life so it would be like you would be doing this broadcasting streams together there would be some i don't know <laughs> whatsapp chat to, i don't know whatever you whatever you can think of to bring people together and to give them something in return for their support and they would be happy to do it and because it's really funny that well, why i'm why, why i'm saying this because it's just there were some a couple of really kind followers of mine who just followed me on Instagram, you know, there's this subscribe button there that you can pay your creator, that they added it recently on Instagram. So every creator now can create the exclusive content on Instagram f f just for your followers. So for example, you can upload some video that would be seen only to your followers who pay you some really little money every month. And a couple of people just followed me on Instagram, even though, I mean, that's a little money, I don't know, maybe a couple of bucks per month, but I don't do any exclusive content. I wasn't even promoting that. I wasn't even saying about anything, but they just wanted to support, you know? They just found this button and it's like, okay, I mean, I would be paying just this two bucks just because I want to support. Isn't it, I mean, amazing. And at the same time, I feel like, okay, I mean, these people are ready to pay their money just to support me just like that without even me doing anything extra specific for them. But I would love to do something specific for them. I would love to give them some preview, some backstage, something that they would be excited about. So that's, I think, also another another way. But again, all that stuff takes time. You gotta be consistent. Doesn't doesn't mean you have to do it every day, but a lot of things to take care of. And that's why I'm thinking that when all these things function together well, merge tabs, streams, YouTube, Patreon, lessons, video courses, whatever, you pretty much set. And at some point you can really decide, okay, I want to spend this month with my family. So I'm going to take two festivals this month for really good money. And I don't have to play 30 concerts for little money. I just going to take these two festivals and I'm going to be at home. I would be working on my music. I would be putting a lot of effort into making my music as best as I can without being worried that I'll have to be constantly on the road and stuff like that. Because also this is something that kind of connected to this concept is that I believe that the best creative things happen when you're lazy, when you have so much time to do nothing. Well, in, in, in a good way. It doesn't mean that you're lazy. It doesn't mean that you spend this time... Um, watching TV. It just means that, for example, if I would be doing private lessons and I would have six students every day on Skype, then after this or on Zoom, then after sixth one, 
at six in the evening or seven in the evening, the least thing I would, the, the last thing I would want to do is to play guitar, because it's been six hours of guitar playing already, and it's like of listening, of analyzing, of talking about it. I'm like, oh God, no. But if you would have the whole day, if you would have the whole day. Just, you know, goofing around, you just played a bit, experimented with that, did something else, and then eventually, you, I don't know, it, it feels like this creative flow is much more natural because you're not restricted. You don't feel like, okay, now I have two hours to play my guitar and I have to create something spectacular. No, you have the whole day. And if it doesn't work out, if it's if, if, if it's just, well, it's not working out, not, not something, not, not anything creative happens out of it, then it's fine. I'm going to do it tomorrow. It's like, I mean, this is, this is, I think this is how you, being very natural in, in, in your in your workflow. You're still being productive, but at the same time, you don't feel restricted. And uh, I think that's also, well, good for your brain, not not to, to, to feel at ease. A hundred percent. And I think the, the Patreon is definitely a good idea. I was talking to this guy named uh, Jamie Robinson. He makes content. He's out of Canada. He's a like phenomenal, like an assassin on the guitar. And he uh, he was telling me, so he, he did that a lot of uh, uh, tutoring like online Skype tutors and then now he has his Patreon page and he's had he's amassed you know 200 I think it was like 200 250 people that are subscribed to him on Patreon and even just that he's able to make a larger income stream from that than he makes off of YouTube which has you know he has 200 and something thousand followers on YouTube and so I think you're you're right and to be to have that idea to go with Patreon and I'm I'm excited to see what what you got going with that in the next little bit there so yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, you, you see that that's the whole thing. It's like when you just engage these dedicated fans, it's kind of it's even better than to try to reach the whole world with your YouTube stuff, especially now considering these weird algorithms when you just when you when half of your videos are just not being shown anymore. So it yeah, makes a lot of sense. That's really great for this guy. I'm really happy for him. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's that's great. And I'm I'm excited to see how how it goes for you. I'm sure it'll go fantastically. You say you have those dedicated followers that are that are that are going to that want to support you even when you didn't offer them anything they were willing to give you you know a couple bucks which is fantastic and now that they have a place where you're going to give them a little extra content provide a little more value and they'll be happy to 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 do that with you but uh like i i don't really want to hold you hold you too much longer there we've been chatting almost two how two hours there uh but is there anything you want to shout out for the shout out for your like channel business something for people that your fans uh, I don't know, I would just, yeah, for, for all the guys who just, well, maybe seeing me for the first time, the name is Alex Misko, super easy, all my content is there on, on YouTube, on, on all the socials you can think of, it's really easy to find, uh, and um, yeah, I mean, shout out to Baton Rouge Guitars, the, the guitars that I play, really, <laughs> really, really proud, check, check it out guys if you feel like, if you're interested in crazy, interesting, in crazy innovative acoustic guitars, that's what they do, and also super affordable, my guitar is actually the most expensive one in their catalog, catalog. So actually, they focus more on the guitars, like within 500, 600 range, range. So it's really well, it's it's really really affordable. So my guitar is kind of also an experiment to make something a bit more expensive than uh, than normal. Because as I said, we could not, unfortunately, we could not make it cheaper at this at this moment, just not to lose the quality. And uh, yeah, all the music is on socials. So see my see my weird guitar stuff, see my weird guitar journey, and uh, yeah, join me in my live concert whenever I play next next in your city close to you. Hopefully, it's getting better because I mean the concert is another thing. It's just the first the COVID swept everything away, and then. Everything just started to slowly got got better. I finally managed to get my visas again and the traveling without like PCR tests all the time. Do you remember that it was this in previous life PCR tests and stuff? It's like and the uh, FFP two the FFP two masks, which are like really proper ones, the white one. Yeah, just great great trauma, <laughs> great mental yeah. trauma. And uh, yeah, and 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 then things just as soon as they started to get better, as soon as I started to get bookings again and everything, then bam, the war and everything got canceled. Again. Again, for political reasons, for non-political reasons, and then I'm I'm still recovering. So it's like the best year in terms of touring was in, was 2019. So it was like before all this stuff happened, and now it's been already like three, four years of this recovery where things just go uh, uh, and then go down and uh, and then go down. Just really, really unlucky time. But anyways, no, no time to complain. Gotta grind. It's like I mean, gotta gotta do gotta do my my work. <laughs>